Hi, this is Doug Fern, and in this tutorial, we're going to follow a recording session from beginning to end. The artist here is Mark Manassian. I've been recording Mark since around 1970, and although we've had a few breaks in between where our focus was directed elsewhere, we seem to always end up in the studio together. Mark writes some really good songs, and our vision of the songs tends to be very similar, and it makes it very easy to, to get his songs recorded. This particular song is called They Don't Know You. Mark played it for me a few months before this session. It wasn't done yet, but he had some really good ideas, and I liked where it was going. He worked on it some more, and then he made a demo of it in his home studio, and we listened to that, thought about it, discussed the instrumentation, we discussed the players we'd like to use, and a, a number of other things, like how long it was going to be, the tempo, and all those sorts of things before we actually got down to recording it. Mark found a very talented percussionist in Andy Vernon, somebody neither of us had worked with before, but uh, he turned out to be a real asset to this project. They worked together on the structure and the, the rhythm part for the song at uh, Mark's studio, and Andy came up with some good ideas for structural changes that uh, Mark liked and I agreed with, and we went ahead and incorporated them. At that point, we made a studio demo, just Mark and guitar, just so we'd have something to play for everybody so they could uh, understand the song. We distributed that to the players that we wanted on the session so that they would understand the song and its structure. For the tracking session, we knew we were going to have Mark singing and playing guitar and uh, Joff Hazelrig on bass, Andy Vernon on percussion, and George Hazelrig on keyboards. We weren't exactly sure what everybody was going to play, but we've worked with Joff and George quite a few times in the past, and we knew that they would find good parts right away. If the name Hazelrig sounds familiar to you, it may be because you know that Joff and George have taken over the manufacturing of all DW Fern products. In addition to that, Joff and George are superb musicians. I've had the privilege of working with some really great people in my career, and Joff and George are certainly up there with the best of them. We set up the studio, which is actually in our former part storage area of our shop. The parts are now all at Joff and George's facility. Gives us a lot more room here and it allowed us to spread out the players a bit, even though our space is really quite small. We knew that there would be some isolation problems, particularly into Joff's upright bass mics, but um, we felt a little bit of bleed probably wouldn't be a problem. The issue was, though, that we thought that it was entirely possible that we would be replacing Mark's vocal and perhaps his guitar part at a later date. So we wanted to have enough isolation there that we didn't really have a problem doing that. I wanted to get it all recorded with them in the same room with good eye contact and the ability to, to communicate easily. But as a backup, I set up a duplicate set of mics for Mark in our shop, which we often use for as a drum booth. But in this case, it was going to become a vocal booth if needed. Also vital to this session is Ian Alexander. Ian has been my second engineer on most of the major re recording projects I've done for over 30 years. And in addition to being very good at doing that and having a, a really good intuitive sense of mic placement and visualizing the patterns, the bleed, the potential problems, Ian is also a very good musician. He's a singer, and we often use him on background vocals. 
Ian makes his living as a voiceover artist, and I'd be willing to bet that you've heard him at one time or another. Also at this session is Ben Neat. Ben is a talented videographer, and he brought some really amazing equipment in order to video record the session. Also at the session is my daughter, Hannon Fern, who's a very talented photographer, and she took all the stills that you'll see in this video. Andy was playing cajon, which is a very interesting instrument, but one that I had never recorded before. I had heard it used in performances, and I thought it was a terrific um, percussion instrument, but I really didn't know much about how to record it. So I contacted my friend Jim Hamilton at Rittenhouse Soundworks in Philadelphia, who's a percussionist and drummer and a studio owner, and asked him for some advice on how to record the cajon. And Jim said, well, why don't I bring one over and you can play around with miking it and see, see what you like. So I took him up on his generous offer and he came over with, and Mark was there as well, and they ran down the song a couple times while I listened to the cajon in the studio, got some ideas about how to mic it, and then set up a couple of mics to record so we could hear how, how it was coming out in the recording. Before the session, I had discussed with Ian what we were going to be doing and some ideas about the layout of the room and the miking. And when Ian got there, we set up the mics as we had planned. As soon as everybody was set up, Ian and I positioned the mics where we thought they would go and listened to what, was, uh, what we could hear in the control room at that point. Everyone knew the song, so it was just a matter of getting coordinated in the parts and making sure everybody understood the structure. I should point out that these people have all spent a lot of time in the studio as studio musicians, and it didn't take them long at all to have the structure of the song and parts figured out. We weren't sure exactly how to end the song, so we wanted to leave several options available to us, including the possibility of fading it out at the end. I generally don't like fade outs. It's sort of a admission that you couldn't come up with a better ending, so we were hoping we would come up with something that would work well for the end. I recorded the first run through, and we listened to it back in the control room just to get some ideas. Everybody was pleased with the sounds we were getting, and the song was starting to sound really good. The one thing that I wasn't totally happy with was the sound of the cajon. It sounded very good, but it didn't really sound as full as I would have liked it. So I asked Andy about miking the cajon, and he said that for performing, he just puts an SM57 inside the cajon, which has a hole in the back of it. I decided to try that as well, in addition to the other mics that I had, and that was the answer for getting just the sound we were looking for. I wanted to be sure that there was enough isolation between the vocal and the guitar so that we could replace one part or the other individually if we had to, or keep one of them. So that was a little tricky to find a way to do that, but our miking setup did a very good job. For Mark's vocal, I used an AKG C414, an old one, which I think is a terrific mic and underappreciated for the sound of it. And for his guitar, I used a Flea C12. Both of these mics were set to the bi-directional position. And although that means that they're equally sensitive off the back and can reduce isolation somewhat, it really wasn't that much of a problem in this setup because Mark sings and plays very loud and there was minimal bleed from the other instruments into his mics. I use the bi-directional position because not only do I like the sound of that, but it also provides an extremely deep null off the sides, uh, theoretically an infinite null, and you can use that uh, property of bi-directional mics to completely eliminate uh, interfering sounds in many instances. In this case, we aim the 
guitar mic null right at Mark's mouth and the vocal mic null at the midpoint of the guitar. The isolation from the guitar into the vocal mic wasn't nearly as good as from the vocal into the guitar, but it was pretty impressive either way. And here are a couple of examples. First, showing you what the vocal mic sounded like soloed, and then the guitar mic soloed, so you can hear the isolation. Darkness settles on the city street You've got no plans and no one to meet Been a loner all of your life Had your share of heartache and strife I've recorded Joff's upright bass many times, and generally what I use is a combination of a large diaphragm condenser mic along with a ribbon mic, typically an AEA KU4 as the ribbon mic and a Bach 251 as the condenser mic. In this case, I set it up a little bit differently. I still use the KU4, but I used a recently acquired Neumann uh, U47 FET from the 1960s, and that turned out to be an excellent choice for Joff's bass. In fact, I'm still exploring this mic and finding new uses for it. I'm actually using it for the voiceover for this video. Although the combination of the two mics sounded very good on Joff's bass, I decided after listening to them individually that the U47 FET was the right sound for this song. Often I'll just use the KU4 or sometimes the combination. The KU4 has a subtle peak around 1.7 kilohertz, which seems to fit the bass sound really well. But I found for this song, the sound I was going for was better captured with a U47 FET. George's keyboard was easy to record because we just took the stereo direct output into a DW Firm VTIF DI, and that was all we needed to do there. Perfect isolation, and it sounded very good that way. I had determined earlier from experimenting when Jim Hamilton came over and played Cajon for me that Smaller mics were probably the best way to go in micing that instrument because they're less intrusive on the player. So what I ended up using was two ADK lipstick style mics, one a cardioid KM84 style mic, and the other one the same body but with a C12 capsule on it. And the two different sounds seemed to work really well. I mic'd either side of the box of the cajon, plus later we put the SM57 inside on a pile of rags. Not much of that SM57 was really needed. By itself, it's, it's just not a good sound, but it added some fullness and depth and bass to the cajon sound, and I was very pleased with the way it came out. All the mics and the DI went through DW Fern VT2 or VT24 microphone preamplifiers. All of the mics were recorded flat, no EQ, no compression, just directly from the mic preamp output into the radar studio inputs. At this point, we were ready to begin recording for real and we actually ended up doing three more takes after that first run through. So we had a total of four. And my feeling at the time was that take three had energy that I really liked, but it was very close to four. They were very similar. And when we listened back to both takes, Andy felt that he played better on take four. So keeping that in mind, 
I was easily convinced that the take four was the one that we would use. Once we had a take we liked, Joff and George could leave. They're both very, very busy with lots of things going on. And from the time they arrived till the time they were packed up and gone was less than two and a half hours. One of the things that we considered originally for this song was using acoustic piano. George has a marvelous 100 year plus old Steinway B style piano in his home studio that he shares with, with Joff. And we thought that maybe that would be the right instrument for it. But when listening to this back, it seemed that the keyboard in the um, Wurlitzer kind of emulation was just the sound we were looking for, and everybody was really pleased with George's performance, so we decided to go with that. But George had some other ideas for additional parts, including a Hammond B3. He has a really wonderful B3 in Leslie, and uh, so he recorded that at home in their studio using a AEA R88 stereo ribbon mic into a VT24. Andy brought a whole collection of percussion instruments, nowhere near his full inventory, but certainly a wide variety of things that we could try. So we had the time and we decided to try putting some of those percussion parts on the song. Basically, Andy played from beginning to end, knowing that we would only pick and choose where I wanted to have them come in and come out. The first thing we recorded was a tambourine, and for that, I just moved over the C12 that we had been using for Mark's guitar, and that seemed to be a good fit for the tambourine sound that we wanted. Next, Andy had some really terrific shakers that he played, a larger one in one hand and a smaller one in the other. And we had the C12 on that, and it sounded great, but I just thought that this interesting combination of sounds would really benefit from being recorded in stereo. I have another C12 and we could have used two match C12s for this, but I decided to go with my very old and treasured Neumann SM69 stereo condenser. So that's what we used on the shakers. Next, Andy added some bongo parts and we used the SM69 for that as well. It sounded good that way. And lastly, Andy added a triangle part. He had quite a few triangles in his bag, and we listened to all of them and picked the one that we ended up using. There didn't seem to be much point in recording that in stereo. It was going to be a very minor part, although important to the overall sound of the recording. So we just used the SM69 with one capsule, just basically as a single mono pickup. We were finished for the day in about four hours, and everybody packed up and we put the mics away and so on. And I made a quick reference mix for everybody, particularly for George to work on a Hammond B3 part and for Mark to work on some other parts that he had in mind. That reference mix gave me an opportunity to make some decisions about where the percussion was best in and out during the song. And although that changed somewhat as the song progressed, basically it ended up being pretty much as I originally decided uh, the percussion parts where they would fit the best. After Mark and I had spent some time listening in independently, of that reference mix, and then another one after George had his B3 part laid in, we both came to the conclusion that the acoustic guitar really wasn't necessary. On the session, Mark played his 1970 Martin D28. For the session, he put bronze strings on the guitar. Normally, he uses phosphor bronze strings. The bronze strings had a different sound to them entirely and they eliminated a lot of that low-end boominess that the D28 and other guitars of that size tend to have. So that was good. But it also had what I concluded were uh, discordant overtones in the guitar sound. That bothered me from the beginning. 
we could have replaced the guitar part with Mark's D28 with different strings on it, or with my triple O eighteen Martin, which is much better in many cases for recording because it lacks that excessive low end that's sometimes troublesome in the studio. But ultimately, it turned out that we didn't need the acoustic guitar at all. It really evolved into a keyboard song because of George's wonderful parts. Mark worked out some vocal harmony parts for use in places and also an electric rhythm part and an electric lead part for use in places in the song. The next session was just with Mark and the first thing we did was we put on a rhythm guitar part which doesn't play through the entire song, not like the acoustic part originally did, but just comes in and out in places. And for that, Mark played his Fender Jazzmaster into a Fender Champ amp. And for that, we needed to find the right sound for the song. About 90% of the sound we got just from playing with the pickups, tone controls on the guitar, and tone controls on the amp. We found the sound we wanted was with the volume setting at only about two and a half. So it was pretty quiet out in the room. But that was the sound we wanted. And for a mic for that, I chose an AEA R92, which was mic fairly close to the speaker. The next part that Mark played was also on the same electric guitar and amp and mic setup, but with some different settings. This was a an accent part that just showed up in the song here and there. At the same session, we replaced Mark's original vocal. Although his original performance was very good, the song tends to change a bit when you add other people's input. And at that stage, we both realized that a different, slightly different interpretation was required. So we've eliminated the original acoustic guitar part and replace the original vocal part. The isolation between Mark and the other instrument mics was not 100%. So you can hear on the intro just a little bit of the acoustic guitar part. Once other parts come in, it's pretty much masked, so you don't really notice it. Mark's original vocal also had quite a bit of bleed into the other mics but his new performance was actually quite close to the original one, uh, except for some nuances, so it almost totally masked it. The only problem area, which doesn't really bother me, was at the end of the song where we decided to leave out the vocal parts and just take it out as an instrumental. So if you listen, you can hear Mark's original vocal bleeding through, which doesn't bother me a bit. I, I kind of like that kind of effect, and it does give you sort of a ghost vocal back there reminding you of what he sang in the song. Mark also had some vocal harmony parts, two parts that we wanted to put on, and for that, I had him back off the mic considerably so that we had a little bit more of a distant, roomier sound, and although our room isn't all that great, it did add a, a little bit of a depth factor to the background vocals. For Mark's new vocal parts, I chose a Flea M49, which is a really good microphone for Mark. It's a very neutral microphone. doesn't have much of the proximity effect you have with other large diaphragm condenser mics. And it has a clarity which really fit with this song. I might have also chosen a ribbon mic for Mark's vocal, and that was sort of a second choice. But a lot of times with a performer, you have to make a decision on what you're going to go with while they're still at their peak in their performance, because singing the song too many times was, was definitely going to impact the, the performance that we got. So I decided to stick with the M49. It did require a little bit of EQ because actually it really needed just a tiny bit of warming up. So with just a little bit of boost 
and the low end provided by a DW firm VT4EQ, it made the vocal sound exactly what I was looking for. The background vocal parts do not have any EQ on them. After each session, I would do another reference mix, and each time it allowed me to refine the mix a little bit more, so that by the time we got to the final mixing stage, we had pretty much everything worked out. Mark came in one other time so that we could go through and listen to some of the tracks and make some decisions on which parts we wanted to use where. We were pretty much in agreement on this, but it was good to make sure that Mark understood what was there, and if I left something out, why, or if I emphasized something, why I did that. Mark and I often have slightly divergent ideas about how the song should ultimately sound, but by working together and uh, commenting back and forth, we often converge on something that both of us are totally happy with. The final mix was pretty easy. By that time, we had refined what parts we wanted coming in where, and actually there's very minimal processing on any of the tracks. It's almost a set the faders and walk away kind of mix because the musicians all did their own dynamics. For example, on George's keyboard part, there's no level changes whatsoever from beginning to end. He did all the dynamics during the session. The vocal track, as is often the case, has the most processing on it. In this situation, I used a very little bit of compression from a DW Firm VT7 on the vocal, maybe 2 to 3 dB at maximum, and a little bit of EQ, as I explained before, to add a little bit of warmth to the sound from the VT4. There's also a couple of short delays from a plug-in that um, just add a, a left and right roughly 40 and 70 millisecond delays on the vocal track. That compensates a bit for the lack of good room sound that we have here. Joff's upright bass has no EQ at all on it. It just has a tiny bit of compression, again, maybe 2 to 3 dB on peaks from a VT7. And on the electric guitar parts, I used a VT4 on each of them with a little bit of low frequency and a bit of high frequency roll off to give the guitars a little bit rounder sound. We achieved about 90% of it with the guitar and amp, but it seemed to benefit from just a little bit more. That's it, there are no other tracks have any kind of EQ or compression on them. On the mix bus, I use my usual setup, which is a VT7 stereo compressor followed by a VT5 stereo EQ. The compression is set for maybe 2 dB um, on peaks, and the EQ had a few dB boost at very gentle broad curve at 10K, and a little bit of roll off at the very low end below 30 hertz. And that was it for that processing. That was followed by a Flux Elixir digital limiter plug-in, which was used to catch some of the peaks which would otherwise limit the overall volume. But it's doing very little otherwise except catching those occasional peaks. For this song, and as my general philosophy, I'm not going for maximum loudness. In fact, I aim for about minus 16 loudness units full scale in, in the final mix. And that seems to work very well for me. I used to go for minus 13, but minus 16 to me allows the music to generally breathe a little bit. And I like that sound better. So now the song is done, thanks to the inputs and efforts of so many talented people. I'm really pleased with the way it sounds. I'm happy with the video that Ben shot and the stills that Hannon took. And I hope you find this tutorial useful to you in at least learning about one approach to recording a song like this. The song is available here 
after the the main part of this video, we'll play the song all the way through. And it's also available on Mark's SoundCloud site, and there's a link for that below. If anybody's interested in hearing a full resolution version of this song, I'd be glad to send you a copy. Just email me with your request. Thanks a lot for watching. Hey.
just need someone to blame Thank you.